So you guys can see that okay? Perfect. Um, so yeah, so I will be um, talking more about coping and stress management today. And like Dr. Forte mentioned, I um, am the psychologist who works with her in our headache clinic. And I wanted to open this by kind of generally mentioning something that I think we're all very aware of given the current times. But I think the biggest thing related to thinking about coping and stress right now is that stress, especially recently, is all over the place, right? We already had kind of day-to-day -day stressors that we were all dealing with, but now um, with COVID-19 that's hit and all the other events and changes that are happening in the world, there's definitely a lot that all of us are dealing with that can make headaches and migraines much more intense. Um, so I definitely wanted to highlight that first. Um, and then secondly, I always like to talk about how there's a mind-body connection. So as Dr. Forte mentioned, migraines are definitely um, a neurobiological complex process that happens in our bodies. Um, but the important thing to remember with migraines, like any other physical symptom that we have, is that our kind of brain and our bodies are connected, um, which is really important because different thoughts and emotions and behaviors actually directly affect our physical health and well being. Um, and we know that there's kind of a direct role in migraines um, with the brain because there are different types of chemical changes and electric impulses that happen when we have a migraine. And so the brain's involvement is pretty significant. And the reason why that's important is because our brains are actually what are responsible for helping us perceive pain and control how much pain um, we might experience or how we respond to pain. And so the good news about this is that there are a lot of different strategies we can use to help, um, given that the mind and body are so connected. Um, so I also like to highlight this initially as well. Um, and just kind of in general, thinking about more general tips of how to navigate the current times with everything going on. Um, I think one of the most important things is to, like Dr. Forte mentioned, identify your triggers or become more aware of what triggers you have that trigger your migraines um, and try as much as you can, right? We can't always avoid every trigger that we have, but we can at least become more aware and maybe modify some of them. Um, another thing that's really important is trying to set boundaries, especially again with everything that's covered in the media and news recently. I think while it's really important to stay on top of what's happening in the world, it can also really um, affect our mood and our level of emotional distress. And so I think it's really important to limit the amount of media and news coverage that you listen to each day, and also try to limit conversations with other people about stressful events that are happening. Because again, it's important to be aware and be updated, but it can just increase and heighten all of that distress. Um, so I think that's really important. And then, you know, especially in times like this, it's helpful to focus on the things that we do have control over. So using the example of COVID, you know, it can be really frightening and scary, but it is helpful to focus on the things you can control, like washing your hands as much as you can, um, you know, wearing a mask when you go out to busy public places or indoors, and just focus on the things that you know are within your power. And then the next one is um, engaging in pleasant activities. So now, especially more than ever, is a really great time to try to be as flexible as possible and get creative. So I think on one of my future slides, there's 
um, kind of a list of pleasant activities. And because of COVID now, I know there are all of these virtual activities that um, people can participate in, like touring the aquarium virtually, going to the zoo virtually, going to museums virtually. So even though it's on Sully, take advantage of those opportunities that are kind of new and have developed because of COVID. Um, and also it's incredibly important to stay as socially connected as you can. Um, you know, I really encourage people to participate in like virtual get togethers, other like social activities with friends or family members, or even do kind of socially distanced activities as well. Even though we have more restrictions on that now, I think it's so important to stay socially connected with other people. Um, and then this, these are all important, but this is a very critical one. It's also really important during times like this to, you know, keep track of healthy lifestyle habits. So eating regularly, making sure you're drinking enough water and staying hydrated, getting enough sleep and exercising as much as you can because ultimately we know that those are really helpful for migraine management and you have to get a little bit more creative during times like this but um, maintaining all of those healthy lifestyle habits are very important as well um, and then another thing that i think um, is very interesting and i've actually found a lot of inspiration from the patients who we work with um, for like, related to this, but I think it's really helpful to look for any silver linings that you might be able to find from the current situation. So as an example, some people might feel that, you know what, like, when I used to have to go to school in person, I had a really tough time managing my migraines and virtual school I've actually found to be more flexible. Um, or other people have said, you know, one of the silver linings is that my family and I have really, you know, gotten to know each other better um, because we're all at home. We've kind of bonded in a different way. So I think it is important to also focus on any silver linings that can come out of less than ideal situations. Um, and then the last two items are just to be kind to yourself during times like this. So definitely being compassionate and having self-compassion and reminding yourself that we're all going through really challenging times right now with everything going on. And it's okay that you have, you know, some good days and other days that aren't so good. Um, it's very common during times like this. Um, but there are different coping skills that you can use to help kind of get through that. And then speaking of virtual learning, I was curious, and for those of you who feel comfortable, um, if you have access to it, if anybody wants to type in the chat whether they're doing virtual learning right now or actually they're um, going to school in person, feel free to write that in the chat just to give us an idea if you feel comfortable. But I thought given all the changes with COVID, I wanted to go through some specific tips for navigating virtual learning. Um, because again, I know this can be challenging, especially when you have migraines because of all the screen time that's required. Um, and it's just a very different kind of daily structure than what you're used to. Um, so I think the most important things when thinking about the virtual learning piece are you know, sticking to as much of a structured schedule as possible. So I think it's actually really helpful to write out your weekly schedule and plan what your day will look like, including when you, you, know, when you go to bed, when you wake up in the morning, when you plan on having like free time and doing pleasant activities that you enjoy doing, and also thinking about a time during the week when you can kind of check in with yourself and assess your progress. So have you completed all the assignments you need to do? Are there things that you're finding more challenging and just kind of checking in with how it's going? 
And then I think another important thing to think about is to try to schedule breaks before you think you need them. So especially for those of you, right, all of you who experience migraines, I think this is critical. Um, and I think especially now that I'm assuming most of you have been in virtual learning for a little bit of time at this point, I think it's good to figure out like how much time um, using a screen can you tolerate before you notice that your headache starts getting a little bit worse. And you should plan to take a break if possible before that time starts. So if you feel like 30 minutes is enough to kind of start giving you a mild headache, it might be important to schedule a break at maybe 20 to 25 minutes to kind of preempt when you think your symptoms might get worse. And you can even set phone alarm reminders um, to remind yourself to take breaks. And I think what's really helpful is that breaks ideally should not involve looking at a screen. So I think if you could take a walk or have a drink or snack, go outside for a few minutes, any of those things just to break up how much kind of fatigue you have from looking at a screen will be really helpful. And kind of related to this, for those of you who have 504 plans or IEPs for your school, I really think it's critical to meet with your coordinator um, to discuss how accommodations that you had in the past might be able to be translated to virtual learning. Um, so as a few examples, um, you know, can certain activities that you need to do online be completed on paper instead of electronically to give yourself a little bit of a break? Or is there any flexibility with your teachers where when they are giving a lecture, instead of being required to look at a screen, can you be allowed to take breaks and listen to the lecture, but either, you know, reduce the brightness on your screen or kind of turn away and focus on something else while you're listening, just to get kind of those screen breaks. Um, and I think ongoing communication with these coordinators at your school can be really helpful so you can share with them, you know, what things are working and what things still feel really difficult and challenging. Um, and again, we're all kind of going through this together. So everybody's new to all of this right now. Um, and then another thing to consider is using anti-glare screens on your computer monitors or blue light blocking glasses, or like I mentioned earlier, even adjusting the brightness on your computer to help with looking at a screen for all that time. And then finally, there are some workspace considerations that I think can be helpful to think about. Um, so one of them is making sure that you designate a space at home for schoolwork. So definitely don't plan on doing schoolwork in your bed, <laughs> um, but kind of finding a space at home where that's where you do schoolwork. And then the rest of the day when you're done with school, you can do other things that aren't in that space. Um, another thing that can be helpful for migraines is to have your workspace situated so that your computer is at eye level and you have a comfortable supportive chair so that you don't have any kind of head and neck strain that can contribute to headache symptoms and make them worse. Um, and then often people find kind of like keeping your headache management tools close by if you need them. So that would be things like water, snacks, heat or cold packs, a stress ball, fidgets, anything that you feel is helpful to kind of cope with your migraine when it might come on. Um, and then try to keep your work environment free of distractions as much as you can. So I personally find that if I really want to focus on something, I have to keep my phone on silent or put it in a drawer and just ignore it for a little while so that I can really focus um, on doing other things. And I think that's something that can be really helpful. Or even using noise canceling headphones if all of your family, you know, your parents are working from home or one of your parents is working from home as well. Um, and thinking about using white noise too, those can all be helpful to consider. 
So the next question, or not question, but um, area that I wanted to address is specifically how can we cope better and lower stress? So one of the types of therapy that Dr. Forte mentioned in her presentation is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is the framework for that type of therapy. So it basically highlights how our thoughts, our feelings, our actions, and our body sensations are all connected and how they all influence one another. And this is something to keep in mind, especially when you experience something like a migraine. And in future slides, I'll actually kind of briefly go over different tools that target each of these different domains that are helpful. And here's the slide I was referring to. So I like to think of this as a coping toolbox that you have for your migraines. And the great thing is that this toolbox can also be helpful for anxiety or worries, for sadness, um, for stress, for anything that you feel is kind of challenging to cope with. Um, and the different components that I'll talk about are distractions, relaxation strategies, staying active and thinking strategies as well. And we'll kind of go through each of those individually. So the first category are distractions. And so the goal of distractions are that they are things to take your mind off of anything that's happening that's stressful and to also try to boost your mood. And the good thing about distractions, even though a lot of us claim that we are very good multitaskers and good at doing a lot of different things at once, it's actually not super accurate that that's the case. Some people are definitely better multitaskers than others. But one of the benefits of this is that when our mind is really focused on the pain, like the pain from a migraine, it's actually a good thing that our brains aren't good at focusing on multiple things at once because distractions are actually effective in turning the pain volume down even just a little bit because it shifts your attention away from the migraine and the pain that you're experiencing. And so the goals with distractions are to think about things that are quick and easy that you can do in any setting. Some of these might involve comforts, right? Like snuggling with a pet is a really popular one or even eating a comfort food to help you feel better. Um, they can be creative activities like art or music, hobbies that you really enjoy doing, um, social activities like spending time with family or friends. And then this is where I mentioned, like take advantage of some of the unique COVID activities that have developed like Netflix parties, um, virtual tours of, like I said, museums, aquariums, zoos, um, all these things online that are available now. I think you can even like tour most of the world online um, because of COVID and do like interesting things like that. Those are all great um, examples of distractions. And then, um, you know, the last one is just making sure to schedule pleasant activities. So this I know can be especially challenging during the school year when you have a lot on your plate trying to manage, but the more you can try to schedule pleasant activities that you enjoy, it will just help you feel better and again, distract you from the other things that are going on. And some people even find it's helpful to make a list on their phone of all the different like quick, easy distractions that they can think of to help with their migraines. So I recommend doing that. And then the next thing I wanted to talk about are especially in a time like this, I think it's really important to focus on what things are really important to you, like what are your values? And I think especially because, right, we've had a lot of different things that have been, you know, taken away in a sense, like we can't really socialize with other people in the same way that, like we used to, or we can't maybe go on some vacations that we had planned, you know, a lot of things have kind of been disrupted. 
But I think now more than ever is a really great time to think about like, what are the things in life that you really value the most? And what are ways that you can live your life according to those values? So for example, are you the type of person who really enjoys helping others and volunteering and doing community service work? And if that's the case, like what kinds of activities could you get involved in um, that where, you know, there's a lot of need right now, what can you do to contribute your part to that? Um, or it might be another great time to think about like, is there a hobby that you've always wanted to start, but you haven't had the chance to, and now is kind of a great time to think about it. But this can be really, really important because I think for all of us, right, no matter who we are, life is very hectic and busy. And I think it's easy sometimes to lose sight of what things we really value um, that are important to us. And then the next kind of section I wanted to talk about is under the relaxation category. So um, I think it's really important to practice relaxation strategies routinely. Um, and the reason why I say that is because any relaxation skill is like any other skill you might learn, like playing a musical instrument or competing in a sport, the more you practice them, the better you'll get at them. Cause it's kind of like training a different muscle in your body. And relaxation strategies can be incredibly helpful for migraine management and also to help cope with any, you know, anxiety, sadness, and stress. Um, so these are very effective and I've listed a few common ones on this slide. Um, you can definitely Google all of these to learn more about them and also learn them with a therapist if you're working with a therapist currently. Um, the first one is deep breathing, which is kind of the most basic and common one that we teach. Um, there's another one called progressive muscle relaxation, which I'll play a little snippet for you in a bit so you get the chance to see what that looks like. Um, there's something called guided imagery where you visualize a pleasant or relaxing place. Um, grounding techniques are where you focus on um, five things you can see four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste to really help kind of ground yourself in the present moment. And then mindfulness and meditation are, you know, actively trying to focus in the present moment and not think about the future and not worry about the past and really just try to be in the present and notice how you're feeling, which both are extremely hard to do. <laughs> but, um, but all of these things can be really helpful. And I always like to say that there are also other relaxing activities that you might find enjoyable, right? It doesn't have to be one of these skills. It could be playing an instrument or listening to music or something else that you find particularly relaxing. Um, but I would definitely encourage you, if you don't have kind of like a relaxation routine already, I definitely encourage you to think about starting one. And this is just a little um, example of progressive muscle relaxation, just to give you guys a taste of what it's like. Um, it is an avatar, so it's kind of like an animated clip, but I'll just play the first minute or so of it. And the goal afterwards is that you feel like these puppies and dogs on the slide. Um, so let me see if this plays for you guys. Let me know if that works. Begin by allowing your body to get more comfortable wherever you are right now. Take some full, slow breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. Allow any distracting thoughts to come and go as if you're watching them floating down a stream and guide your attention back to your slow and easy breathing. When you're ready, breathe in and make a tight fist with your right hand. Hold 
and focus on what that tension feels like to you. Now, breathe out and release all the tension in the fist. Let your hand become nice and loose. Again, make a tight fist with the right hand and hold it. Then, let the tension and the hand relax fully. Focus on what your hand feels like to you when it is relaxed. Next, slowly breathe in and bring your right forearm up to your shoulder and tighten your upper arm. Hold. Now, breathe out and release. Okay. Hopefully you guys could all hear that and see that. Um, but that that's just an example of a relaxation technique. And the goal is that you would tense and release all the different muscles in your body going through that exercise. Um, so some people especially find this really helpful and effective to do um, before they go to sleep at night um, or when they're just experiencing a lot of stress and need to calm down. It can be a really helpful technique. Um, and actually the website that has that relaxation exercise is one of the resources I have towards the end of my presentation that I'll go over. Um, and then the next thing that I wanted to just quickly mention is mindfulness. So I actually thought it would be helpful to watch a quick video on this as well, just because mindfulness can be so hard um, to describe and understand. Um, but the goal of it, again, is really to focus on things in the present moment. Um, so as the photo on this slide says, like, your body is present, but is your mind, right? Normally our minds are all over the place. We're planning the next day. We're thinking about something that happened over the weekend. And mindfulness activities, the goal of them is to help you really focus on the here and now. Um, and they can be very effective relaxation techniques as well. Um, so I will play this for you just so you get more understanding of what this looks like. Everyday mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Often when people think about mindfulness, they imagine someone sitting on a cushion alone in a room with their eyes closed. Sometimes that is what mindfulness practice looks like. And sitting with your eyes closed in this way has great benefits. But mindfulness is also so much more. Mindfulness is a way to approach everyday life that makes living more enjoyable and less stressful. You can apply mindfulness to everything you do, whether you are eating, walking, or sitting in class. Mindfulness is a choice that you can make at any moment. Mindfulness can help you better understand how you feel and what you are experiencing. It's about being aware of the present moment instead of replaying the past or worrying about the future. Mindful awareness means being aware with kindness. It's about being engaged in everyday life, choosing to be nice to yourself and others in the present moment, and bringing an open awareness to all moments, whether those moments are pleasant, neutral, or maybe even unpleasant. Bringing to that awareness some curiosity and kindness instead of judgment and criticism. You may be surprised at what you learn if you are curious and kind. This does not mean that you need to be meditating. You just need to be paying attention on purpose with a little friendliness. This can help you with stress or anxiety or even sadness. It helps you focus on what is happening right now because worrying about the future or the past all the time 
can be exhausting. Practicing paying attention in a kind way to little things can help train your mind so you can develop more ease across your life. Anything can be leveled up with mindfulness. Here are some examples of ways you can be mindful in everyday life. Right now, you might be sitting in a chair watching this video on your phone. How heavy does your phone feel in your hand? What parts of your hand is the phone touching? Is your phone hot, warm, or maybe cool? Are you sitting down? What parts of your body are being supported by the chair? If you are standing, can you feel which parts of your feet are connected to the ground? Or where you are placing the weight of your body on your feet? This is all mindfulness. Or maybe when you're talking with someone, instead of listening to them so that you can give them a response or to answer them, listen with the goal of understanding them better. This is a little change that can make a big difference in a conversation. The trick is not to automatically react to what you're paying attention to. Just notice what body sensations and emotions come up. And notice your reactions or judgments because there will be judgment. Just try not to judge yourself for how judgmental you might be. There's no right or wrong. Just noticing what's happening in the moment. This can be noticing what's going on around you or inside of you. Let any and all things that you notice be there. You can practice this type of mindfulness anytime, anywhere, and under any circumstance. Simply be aware of what's happening in that moment, like this moment. What are you noticing right now? Okay, hopefully that explained it um, a little bit better. And then the next thing I wanted to mention is that sometimes it can even be helpful to keep um, something like a gratitude journal, which again just highlights the things that you're grateful for. So even though you might have a pretty bad migraine day, what are other good things that happened that day? Or what are things that you're grateful for? Um, this is definitely a pretty simple activity that can boost your mood pretty well. And then the next category I wanted to talk about is related to thinking patterns and ways we think. And so I always like to say that all of us as humans, right, tend to fall into certain thinking patterns um, because our brains like taking shortcuts um, related to processing different information. And so I think there are a few critical ways that we can think about the thoughts that we have and turn those thoughts into more realistic, helpful thoughts that make us feel better. Um, and one way to do this is to really think about the validity of the thought that you have. So how realistic is it? And what is the evidence to support that thought? Um, so kind of going through the checklist here on this slide, I think the first thing that's helpful is to ask yourself, what is the evidence that supports this thought I'm having? And then what is the evidence that does not support this thought that I'm having? And then kind of meeting in the middle, like what is the most likely thing to happen um, in this situation, right? Like what is the worst case scenario? What's the best case scenario? And what do I think is the most likely thing to happen? And then finally, what would I tell a family member or friend who had a similar thought? And the reason I bring this up is because, of course, when we're in pain, right, or when we experience migraines, it can really change our thinking. And it's easy to think pretty negatively during those times. Um, so one thought that might pop up is, oh my gosh, a migraine's coming on. This is never going to get better. It's going to completely ruin my day, right? It could be a very common thought that people experience. Um, and the goal of this 
I always like to say, isn't to think about overly positive thoughts that aren't realistic, but to think about thoughts in a more realistic way. Um, so what, again, is the most likely outcome that will happen? And another way um, that we like to think of this is something called reframing, where you change a negative, unhelpful thought into a thought that's more realistic and helpful. So as an example, if you did have the thought, oh, like I woke up with this migraine, my whole day is going to be terrible today, right? Maybe you can think back to another time when you also had a migraine, but you maybe were still able to do one or two things that you wanted to do, right? Or maybe your migraine won't last as long as you anticipate that it will last. But kind of coming up with other ways to target your thoughts is really important because again, our thoughts affect how we feel and what we do. Um, so this is something else to keep in mind. And then, of course, um, related to healthy lifestyle habits, it's really critical to stay active for your physical health and emotional health. And so I've listed some things, right? It doesn't always have to um, be a particular type of activity. I think oftentimes people struggle with this because um, they find it hard to think of creative ideas of ways they can stay active, but it could even be something as simple as stretching or taking your dog for a walk, um, going on a bicycle ride, helping out in the yard and gardening, um, kind of to whatever physical level you feel you can tolerate. And I think, again, like using technology to our advantage, there are lots of great YouTube videos um, with different workouts that you can use and fitness apps. Um, so this one's really important. And even right now with you know, how everything's changed in our worlds. I think even just being able to get outside and go for a walk can be really important. Um, so definitely keep this one in mind as well. And then I won't go through all of these just for the sake of time, but I did um, just give a few tidbits on sleep because I know it's very common when you have migraines to have trouble falling asleep and staying asleep, which is super understandable. Um, and I think, you know, some of these key things can really help with sleep. Um, the first one that I think is the most important is trying to stay to as much of a consistent sleep schedule as you can. So going to bed and waking up around the same time every day, it's definitely okay for weekends to be slightly different and not exactly the same, but the more you can keep it consistent, the better your sleep will be. Um, and then the other one that I'll highlight that's also really important is to only use your bed for sleeping. So frequently, right, it's common for a lot of the patients I see um, to be doing homework in bed or eating in bed or watching TV in bed. And unfortunately, all of those activities trick our brains into thinking that we should be awake when we're in our bed. And that's why it makes it harder um, to get to bed at night because it kind of confuses our brain about what should be happening. Um, so really try to do all of those things in different spaces, like ideally outside of your bedroom, but if it has to be in your room, at least try to sit at a desk um, or sit in a chair and not kind of be in your bed. That's also really important. Um, and like I said, I won't go through all of these for the sake of time, but you can definitely um, take a glance at some of these other ones related to napping and screen time and how to kind of handle worrying at night and things like that as well. And then kind of to sum everything up, I wanted to say that sometimes it can be really helpful to create your own coping plan for migraines. So it could even be something as comprehensive as, you know, identifying the different triggers that you've noticed that trigger your migraines and also writing down different ideas of what things you find help you. So whether, again, it's, you know, avoiding certain triggers or doing certain relaxation activities or distractions and kind of just 
writing down a like all the different coping tools that help you. Um, you can either like create a list of them and put them up somewhere, or you could even kind of make this on your phone too, just to keep track of what things are really helpful for you. And then I wanted to highlight um, a few website resources that I think are really helpful. Um, the two at the bottom, the American Headache Society and American Migraine Foundation are just really helpful that give kind of guidance on migraines in general. Um, and you can get more information on those websites. The first website is um, the headacheleliefguide.com. And this is actually a website that was created by Children's Mercy in Kansas City. And it actually has a lot of really great educational videos that you can look at to, that go over like what a migraine is and the different strategies you can learn to control your migraine better. Um, and they have a whole kind of section and tab on relaxation strategies. So that progressive muscle relaxation exercise that I showed earlier is actually part of that website. Um, but they go over deep breathing and guided imagery and some other relaxation tools. So I would definitely recommend checking that website out. And then another website that can also be really helpful, particularly for those of you who experience more chronic migraines, um, is a website called The Comfortability. And this website is geared towards um, children and teens with chronic pain. But again, if you kind of fall under the chronic migraine category, it can also be really helpful. Um, it provides really great resources. Again, relaxation exercises that you can download to your phone um, or tablet and also other resources like how to talk to your school about setting up accommodations um, and lots of lots of opportunities teen chats that you can join so I also recommend that you check that website out as well and then, of course, because of technology, there are so many apps these days that we can use for all sorts of different things. Um, I've just highlighted a few on this list that I think are particularly helpful. Um, and one headache, or I should say migraine specific one that isn't on this list but is wonderful is Migraine Buddy that we recommend patients download to just to kind of track your symptoms and triggers. But the ones on this slide are specifically to help with relaxation, worries, sadness, stress, all of those things, um, and can be really great to check out. I, I often recommend this, especially for those of you who might be a little hesitant about um, working with a therapist, if that's been recommended in the past. This can be a really nice kind of gateway into doing that, just to see what you think about the apps and learning some of the skills that a therapist might teach you. Um, so I would definitely suggest checking these out as well. And then, um, you know, finally related to specific therapy resources. Again, I always like to say that I think um, therapy and psychological treatment can be really helpful for the pediatric migraine population. And it's not because there is anything like going on mentally that is wrong with you or anything to that degree whatsoever. It's more so because like Dr. Forte mentioned, we know that there are other non-medicine strategies that can be really helpful for migraine management. And especially for those of you who have tried a lot of different medicines that either like haven't worked or have given you, you know, not so great side effects. Um, I would definitely encourage you to try some of these things because um, there is a lot of evidence supporting them and they can be really helpful. Um, and the main two types of therapy that I recommend are cognitive behavioral therapy and biofeedback because they both have a lot of research and evidence supporting their effectiveness. Um, and if you're interested in this at all, um, you know, I always encourage families to get a referral through your pediatrician 
or your headache specialist, your neurologist who you see, or even contacting your insurance company to ask for um, local referrals. Another option that I like to um, associate with, it's kind of like a dating app in a strange way, but for finding a therapist, is called um, Psychology Today. And it's a really great website where you can type in your zip code and filter for what type of therapy you're looking for, even the gender of the provider you'd like to work with and their specialty area. And it'll actually filter down all the different therapists and psychologists that work um, in your area. So I think that's a great tool to use as well. And thank you so much for listening. Um, I also wanted to pause here to see if there were any questions that anyone had. Thank you so much, Dr. Forte and Dr. Wright.